Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm talking with Shioma Lee Craythorn. Shioma has a PhD in psychology from Aston University. She's the founder of BDD and Me. And one of her major areas of research is body dysmorphic disorder, which is what we talk about on the episode today. We give for the first half of the conversation a pretty extensive overview on the diagnostic and clinical criteria and presentation of body dysmorphic disorder. Um, and we talk about it in the episode, body dysmorphic disorder is within the obsessive compulsive disorders and other related disorders category, the DSM-5. Um, it's not talked about much and it's not researched much. And so she has done lots of research on it. Her dissertation was on it. And so um, it was wonderful to, to get her on and, and really talk about something that affects a lot of people, and, but a lot of people don't know a lot about. We start out by talking about what body dysmorphic disorder is, the DSM criteria and description of it. We talk about the difference between the pathological and non-pathological issues with one's body and appearance. We give the diagnostic differential with, um, from OCD. We also talk about the differential and comorbidity with eating disorders. Um, we talk about the specifier of muscle dysmorphia. And on all for that, because muscle dysmorphia is, that, that specifier with um, body dysmorphic disorder is most commonly seen in, in males. It's not only seen in males, but commonly. We talk about some of the themes of masculinity today and some of the issues that males can have with certain um, body image uh, challenges. We talk about the epidemiology and etiology of body dysmorphic disorder. We discuss the role of social media on body dysmorphic disorder, impact of cosmetics and plastic surgery, and some of the cultural syndromes associated with body dysmorphic disorder. The second half of the conversation, we really talk about a lot of the work she did in her dissertation. She used a lot of qualitative data to get at some of the phenomenological experiences of, of those with body dysmorphic disorder. Um, in her dissertation, she used a lot of art, uh, a lot of visual and graphic aids to try and understand the internal experience of someone that is um, dealing with body dysmorphic disorder. We talk about some of the philosophical ideas implicated with art and BDD. And then we end with treatment for body dysmorphic disorder. I have to say, you know, this is not something I study um, Often, I'm not an expert in body dysmorphic disorder, and so it was wonderful to talk to someone that is, who's spent many years um, researching this, and uh, I, I was really pleased uh, about how not only, you know, I feel like you could walk away from the conversation and have a better understanding of the disorder, but also really, really incredible qualitative work um, that she's doing and trying to continue to do and really understanding the complexities of the inner experience of someone that's living with the disorder. Um, you know, someone that's living with uh, body dysmorphic disorder is going to have many, many, many challenges that most people aren't going to see. And so her research is trying to really get at that. Um, and I think that's extremely important. Um, so now I bring you Shioma Lee Craythorn. I'm here with Shioma Lee. How's it going? Hi, Xavier. Nice uh, to be here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, you have some really fascinating research that I think doesn't get discussed enough. And uh, I came across your, your work. And so I want to give some time to this research and, and uh, talking about these issues. So I appreciate you coming on and doing that. So before we get into it, people don't know you. So just tell us uh, who you are and what your um, research areas are, what your background is, education, et cetera, anything you want to share. And uh, yeah, we'll start, we'll start there. Yeah, thank you. My name is Shoma Lee Craythorn, and I'm a, a postdoc researcher uh, specialized in understanding people's experiences of body dysmorphic disorder. I do uh, research on the experiences of living with well, not living with, of being treated for COVID-19 in intensive care. Um, and I'm about to start a new research project on the experience of being racially bullied as well. Um, I'm particularly keen on qualitative research methods, um, in particular, 
interpretative phenomenological analysis. So phenomenology plays a really big part in my, in my research in gaining deep understandings of people's experiences. And I recently completed my PhD in psychology at Aston University in, in the UK. That's, that's wonderful. How, how did you uh, get into uh, body dysmorphic disorder? Uh, this is uh, for, for folks that don't know, um, we'll get into it, but body dysmorphic dis disorder is a uh, <clears throat> disorder that is usually kind of tucked away, hidden in the, the DSM-5. It is in the new categorization of the uh, obsessive compulsive and related disorders, which is a, a new category for the DSM-5, I believe. And body dysmorphic disorder is one of them. So it's not well known and it's not, uh, it's not talked about often. Um, so it was just, just one of those things where it was like, well, I need, a, I, need a, I need a topic and I'll pick it or just, just loosely as much as you want to share. What kind of got you into it? And, and then we'll talk about your kind of angle of, of the phenomenology and everything like that. Yeah, well, exactly as you said, it's um, really under research. There's not a lot of um, work out there about it. And something I stumbled upon and started learning a bit more about when I reached the age of 20-ish. And so started looking online for a bit more information about it, but could hardly find anything. And so I decided to start my own research project about it, applied to do a PhD. I, I did my PhD self-funded. I had four jobs throughout it, so it was quite tough. But wow. it's been it's been really rewarding. Mm. I'm really happy that I found this research area. Mm. Uh, before we get into the details, so just one last question here is about you. You have the PhD in psychology, um, which is which is pretty awesome. But uh, the aspects of using phenomenology, which is usually within the realm of philosophy, um, mm. is is interesting. You know, most people would probably say, well, how do you, how do you mix, you know, phenomenological data, uh, with, uh, a degree in psychology? How did you find that, uh, kind of marriage or what, what have you, um, in doing your research? How did you find it? I think it, it made sense uh, quite early on. I decided I wanted to be able to gain access into people's, you know, really gain a deep understanding into what, what it was like for people to live with this condition. And the quantitative research, it, it was fantastic in telling us, you know, what the disorder is and treatments and so on. But it wasn't really getting to the heart of what, what, it, what it is, what it means to people. So by using qualitative research methods that helped me to, to do that, but phenomenology in particular, it just helped me gain access into, the, into each individual's life worlds, really, and uh, to find out how it affects their lives and how they how they came to understand their own being in the world with having BDD. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really important, and it's uh, I think it's really really valuable. So, all right, let's 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 talk about the disorder first. Um, so, body dysmorphic disorder, as I mentioned, is a is a newer. Uh, um, it's just excuse me, it's within the new category in the DSM five for OCD. So it, it's it's in the same, I guess you could say, universe or the same orbit as obsessive compulsive disorder, um, although it is distinctly different. Um, and so what are the distinctive features um, of body dysmorphic disorder? You know, how does it uh, manifest or present um, and how could people notice it? And then we can talk about the differential from OCD. Uh, the main feature of BDD is having a preoccupation with one or more perceived defects in, in the physical appearance. Um, and other people are really unlikely to be able to pick up on that or actually see the defect. It's, it's something that I don't like to use the word imagine because it suggests that the person is not really seeing it, but it, it's, um, it's not visible to other people. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of an internal way of looking at yourself, right? So yes, intrinsically yeah. to the per or not intrinsically, but internally to the person, they perceive that they have a, uh, a, a defect, whereas other people don't see it that way. Is there, just while we're on that, can you give maybe just an example of something or common examples of how this kind of uh, presents? What's a common defect people sometimes say? It can be any part of the body at all, but I'd say um, BDD tends to focus more on facial features 
So particularly the face or uh, skin texture, mm -hmm. uh, hair, nose, anything at all on, on the face. It can affect any body part, but usually um, focuses on the face. So it could be something like, you know, my eyes are too close together or they're too far apart or, you know, uh, my nose is too big or, you know, my have skin blemishes somewhere, things like that. Right. It's it's there's a yeah. preoccupation now. I feel like for for the average listener, they may say, well, sure. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people feel that way on any given day or week. You know, they're just like, yeah, I don't like how I look today or, oh, you know, this is a blemish or, or something like that. And I, I don't really like it or. You know, there's there's thing there's little little things that people are just kind of not crazy about themselves. So how does this become disorderly, or how does this become so uh, um, impactful for the person that we can say it's yeah, this is just beyond uh, what you would say is I don't want to say normative, but it's um it's, it it borders on the level of you know something of patho pathology, right? Where we can say this is a disorder. How do we make that distinction between uh, th that difference? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that people, everyone, as you said, experiences at some point a dislike of a particular feature. They just, they're not happy with how they look. I would describe that as normative discontent. So mm -hmm. there are very few people who would be 100% happy with how they look. But with BDD, it becomes um, it becomes a real issue with socialising, with having relationships, being able to go out and be seen by others it can be really challenging for somebody with BDD. They might look in the mirror for hours in the day. Again, that's not to do with vanity or to do with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just wanting to do that it's a compulsion almost um having to monitor the appearance and it causes a lot of significant distress as well for yeah. the individual yeah kind of what the, that, that's really helpful because it sounds like what is most um uh coming out here is that it's it really is an internal thing for the person right mm -hmm. this is going in their head this is their uh, self attributions or self evaluations of their physical appearance. Um, and less so about, you know, did somebody say something or, you know, did they look at them weird or something like that? I mean, they might perceive it that way, but it just really is their internal, uh, operations of how they're viewing themselves. Is, is that about right? Yeah, exactly. It is exactly what they are seeing. Mm -hmm. So, so what are some of the other, uh, uh features for body dysmorphic disorder? Um, and this is where it gets quite similar to OCD, that you, you would have repetitive behaviours as well that um, the individual might engage in. It's usually things like mirror checking, uh, skin picking, seeking reassurance about the perceived defects of asking people quite often if they look okay, or does this part look okay, um, and camouflaging the perceived defect as well is mm -hmm. something that's quite common, whether that's with certain clothing that you might choose to wear or doing your makeup in a certain way, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. So this is on a kind of, mm, I, I guess, I don't, if I remember correctly in the DSM, there's no frequency necessarily, it, you know, not three times per week or something like that. I think it's just, no. it just says frequently or, yeah, um, you know, that there's where it's repetitive enough, but, um, we'll get to this, but, uh, about the uh, cosmetics and plastic surgery and all that stuff. We'll get to that in a bit, but outside of that, it, it really is a kind of, again, because a lot of this is in, internal, there's a kind of, I got to do something to fix this, right? If I have a, a defect or I have a blemish that they perceive, well, somehow it has to be corrective. And so again, another, this compulsion to be like, okay, I have to, do something about it. And so that's what you're saying that, you know, the, the skin picking or the, the, the mirror checking, et cetera. But these are, these are examples of how this could happen just on an everyday or every weekly basis uh, of sorts. This is without any external corrective surgery. This is just something that people usually do um, to try and uh, alleviate any of their negative ideas about their self image. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I would say is that, I mean, the price of cosmetic surgery is, is huge and mm -hmm. 
there are lots of people who wouldn't be able to even afford to have that or afford to have certain procedures or treatments on their appearance. So this is something that they really struggle with. And I think it, it, we'll get on to it a bit later, but in the, in the media, the way it's portrayed is that people with BDD are obsessed with cosmetic surgery and you might expect to see somebody with a really extreme appearance that has been cosmetically altered, but that's not the case at all. It's, um, I think you have to be in a really privileged position to be able to afford mm -hmm. cosmetic surgery. So for a lot of people with BDD, then they don't go and do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this sounds very similar to uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Um, which, you know, I won't do the, the differential here, but, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder is a clinical uh, disorder. It should not be confused with obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which is a, a personality disorder, and that distinction is uh, difficult and nuanced. But how can we know the difference? Um, I don't believe they're comorbid. I don't, I don't have the DSM memorized, but uh, you can't have both, or can you? Right? You can't have you can. OCD. You, you, you can. And, you okay. can. You can. So how do we? How do we? That's interesting. How do we uh, do the differential? So how can we tell the difference between, um, you know, the compulsive checking, etc., mm -hmm. for 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 uh, BDD, and then how would that look different for OCD? Uh, so uh, let's answer that first, then we can talk about the comorbidity. Yeah, I would say that um, BDD focuses specifically on the body. Um, and if I give you a quick example of the, the type of yeah. action somebody might do, so I know it's not my, not my favorite example for OCD because I don't think it represents a disorder properly, but hand washing, if I just take that as an example, mm -hmm. a person with BDD might hand wash frequently, but the reason behind it might be to do with the body. For example, they might wash their hands repeatedly so that they don't spread bacteria to their face and then cause uh, an acne breakout mm, or mm. whatever it might be that they're concerned about. So the, the body is the main focus in, mm. in those BDD compulsions. Yeah, so, th so this really has to go back to, again, this is all very internal. Uh, even though there's the behaviors of the, com the, the repetitive or compulsive behaviors, there's the, the origins or the starting point is very internal which, you know, it has to do, I guess, with the, with the body here, whereas OCD can be many things. Mm. Okay. And how does, um, so how, how can you have both? So I guess, I mean, I guess in theory, I guess you could, right, if I'm thinking through it, right, you could have uh, a very strong preoccupation with some defect for, your, for, for one's body, and you could also have compulsions and uh, uh, obsessions about other aspects as well, which would be characterized under OCD. So is that just typically how it works? Is it common to be uh, to, for a person to have both or, or how did they work together? I'm not sure exactly how many people would have both together. I know it is certainly possible to have both. Um, but as you said, I imagine the BDD compulsions would focus on, on the body and the internal aspects, but it might manifest itself differently through um, the ex external environment with OCD compulsions as well. Mm. So I think they are very distinct, but they are similar. That's why it gets difficult to, uh, to separate them really. But one thing I would say is that um, in the BDD literature, there has been discussions and debates about whether BDD should have its own body image category. Mm. rather than being uh, mm -hmm. classified with OCD. Yeah. And I can, see, I can see why that would be helpful um, because sometimes the distinction, people focus more on OCD and then BDD is not really focused upon or considered as its own disorder. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And um, obviously, the, like with most DSM disorders, there's this uh, usually criteria of it has to cause significant impairment in functioning, uh, usually in, you know, social or occupational or, um, educational, uh, domains. Um, but also how do we, uh, understand because of the body image, uh, emphasis, how do we determine this from uh, a type of eating disorder such as anorexia or bulimia? Um, I don't know if those are com comorbid or, or if there is an important distinction to make between, um, 
uh, those two categories. Is there anything you want to say about that as well? Or yeah, um, they they can become more, but again, as I mentioned earlier, the BDD focuses more on perhaps individual body parts, mostly on the face, facial structure, and mm -hmm. features. Whereas anorexia nervosa focus on the size of the body mm. and body fat and build of the body. Mm -hmm. um, they can both occur together, but the main distinction is, is that, and with BDD as well, some people might engage in restrictive eating, for instance, mm. but that would be to improve the appearance of an individual body part or the appearance of a certain part of the body. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it seems, how I'm understanding is that it, it, it usually seems to be very localized to a part of the body, mm. not necessarily the whole kind of gestalt of the body, whereas anorexia probably is more for that. But but that said, <clears throat> it both seem to have this emphasis on um, appearance and body image mm. or how, how they understand how or how they or excuse me how they're perceiving how they appear uh either just in general or definitely in the context of, of of other other people so there's an interesting um I, we'll just get to this and then we can talk about some of the other background there's a with all disorders uh, or i shouldn't say all most disorders they have a usually a list of specifiers and there's a boring history of how the DSM came, DSM five came about of trying to make it more of a uh, multidimensional and continuous kind of thing. I won't bore listeners with the whole history of the DSM five, but instead of having basically a bunch of very different disorders, it was trying to kind of uh, synthesize. So we have, you know, one disorder and then a bunch of specifiers. Um, that's how it works for some of them with body dysmorphic disorder there is a specifier uh, called muscle dysmorphia, uh, which is basically the idea that the person believes their body is too small or insufficiently muscular. Um, and so this is, when I was looking at the, some of the literature on this, this is predominantly in males. I, that's not to say that it's not in females, uh, but I think it's, I don't know the percentage, but I think it's a, overwhelming majority in uh, males that have uh, body dysmorphic disorder. And so what do you uh, know about this specifier? How often do we see it? And just tell us a little bit about this. Yeah. Um, again, that's a really good point to bring up. I haven't personally had experience of working with people, talking with people who have muscle dysmorphia specifically. But what I would say is I think there's a danger of assuming that people with muscle dysmorphia are always going to be male mm -hmm. and people with body dysmorphia are always female that's mm -hmm. something that comes up quite a lot um when it's portrayed you know in the media or online in you know, other outlets that people think that men can't have body dysmorphic disorder because it's something that only women would be worried about mm -hmm. um and again i think that is to do with the the way that masculinity is portrayed in society mm -hmm. that men couldn't be obsessed or concerned with a part of their body or face because that would be that would just be frowned upon it wouldn't be accepted mm -hmm. whereas muscle dysmorphia i feel that sometimes people use that term instead of body dysmorphia mm. using them interchangeably mm -hmm. um when I mean, they can occur together, definitely, but I think that there is a danger of the two being assigned to specific genders. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, the data is muscle dysmorphia uh, is higher in males. Again, that's not to say that it doesn't happen in females, mm -hmm. but that the, the data shows that it is higher in males. Uh, I don't want to make a complete comparison, but just like many of the, the two major eating disorders, anorexia and bulimia, are higher it's a nine to one ratio for the last time i checked it's like 90 percent female and 10 percent males although i will say this <clears throat> from what i know a lot of this stuff goes underreported and or misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed etc and so you will have many um males that will not report their symptoms or not report some of these um potentially repetitive behaviors 
And again, just to, to clarify, muscle dysmorphia is a specifier under body dysmorphic disorder. Um, and so, and at least in the context in which we're talking about it, um, you know, it, it is very possible for, for males to have body dysmorphic disorder and, you know, could have this specifier or, or not. But, um, so, but I think you bring up a good point, though, which is we, we, we shouldn't look at it too much in this, uh, you know, these kind of these two buckets of sorts, right? You know, these are, you know, the data is the data, but it doesn't mean that males can't have it. And if you overemphasize that data point too much, my suspicion is that you'll get a lot of men that won't report their symptoms, mm. which is, you know, we don't, we don't want that either. Right. We want people to get better and to have treatment. And so, um, yeah. Any, anything else that you, that you want to say about this specific specifier? Yeah. Um, one other thing I'd add with muscle dysmorphia is people, there's, there's the physical dangers of, um, muscle dysmorphia, such as, that you might associate with excess steroid usage, for instance, um, feeling compelled to train even if you've already been injured previously and things like that. So that is definitely something to look forward to that I think would be specific to muscle dysmorphia. Again, could occur with body dysmorphic disorder, but I think that would most likely be quite specific to uh, MDD there. So that's something really important to look out for as well, because um, it could lead to physical illnesses and all sorts of problems. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, I, I, I I'm just gonna, you know, just uh, speak uh, loosely here. These are fresh thoughts, so so bear with me. Um, I, I've I've talked about it a little bit on on here and 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 just personal conversations, but. I think that um, there's there are uh, challenges with I think talking honestly about what masculinity is and is not in the 21st century, and you know as it goes, right? You know, people <laughs> people want to to box things in in these extreme categories right you know if if men like to you know i'm just using this generally but if men like to do traditional uh, masculine things you know lift weights and fix cars and whatever else right you know that we label that toxic masculinity which certainly exists which certainly is a thing for sure um but i think traditional aspects or many or all traditional aspects of masculinity aren't all toxic. And I don't think they're all inherently bad. Um, and then there's the other extreme where it has to be this very, um, passive and, uh, very conciliatory. And, um, I would say sometimes overly emotional kind of definition of masculinity as well. And it, and almost where there's, there, you know, traditional masculinity is kind of wiped out and it's like this very strange new thing that is, um, I think sometimes feels forced. I think my take on this is that masculinity has to be, because I think it always has been, like most things in life, a type of continuum. Right. And that's going to come down to many things, including uh, physique, including body image and body type, um, interest, careers, um, et cetera. Right. So, you know, the stereotype of, you know, uh, you know, men don't cry and they don't show their emotions and tough it up and all that stuff is, I think, pretty silly. Right. I think <laughs> I don't think it's accurate to say that. I think we're I don't think that's the way to, to talk to younger men. Um, but I, I don't think that it should be, you know, that we're totally ignoring um, some of the different uh, gender or sex differences. I don't think we should be able to, you know, I don't think we can put things in one bucket, right? Or two buckets, mm. if you will. There's a continuum. And so I think we need to be able to be fine, men, um, and, and then other people in society need to be fine with there's different types of dudes and they're, they're going to have different interests and different styles and different everything. And so in terms of the body dysmorphia, 
you know, there are partly because of biology or genetics, you know, and environment. There's just going to be some some guys that aren't um, that don't have certain body types, and they're not going to be able to lift uh, crazy amounts of weight, and and they might not have an interest in doing that, and that's perfectly fine, right? And it's perfectly fine for, you know, the dude in the gym that's lifting 400 pounds and, you know, likes to do protein shakes. And that's fine, too. I mean, I don't think these things are a, when we when we place a moral valuation on these things or we, we pro, um, impose a kind of positive attribution on one or the other or negative attribution. With it, you know, I don't really know if that I mean, you can do that, but I don't know if inherently that's always wise to do. Um, and so I, my take on this and how it works with the dysmorphia piece is that I think if people, if in society we had um, a more balanced way of talking about masculinity to young men, um, that was more on a continuum, you know, wide ranging way of understanding masculinity, I think that potentially you could have... Um, as a as a cultural or societal kind of point, less and less of a stigma with people that have muscle dysmorphia and maybe have <clears throat> better treatment. And so I think that, you know, there's the, there's, there's the man that has body dysmorphic disorder with muscle dysmorphia. And the, the first problem, it will, well, I don't say the first, but one of the problems is having it, but then also never saying anything about it. And, you know, that's, that's a, that's an added problem that's not necessary. And so I think if in society, we had better ways of discussing those things, or, or talking about those things uh, accurately, and in a healthy, balanced way, um, you know, I think you could reduce that. So um, I don't know, those, <laughs> that's my, my fresh thoughts on, on that. I don't know if you have any, any ideas yeah. or, or disagreements or whatever about that. But you know, feel free to share. Yeah, I just add, um just as you're explaining it, it made me think of a, um, there's been a new sort of video series called Men Have BDD2, mm. which was um, organized by the Body Disorder Foundation, a charity based in the UK for BDD. And that was one of the things that they were discussing. They were talking about how a lot of men feel that they can't talk about their body image because it would be perceived as wrong or you know men can't have even uh, issues with their body image because it wouldn't be it wouldn't be right mm -hmm. but it was a it was really good so i'd encourage your viewers if they're interested to have a have a look at that yeah no no i think that's great yeah i think it's again we're not talking about <clears throat> you know this is a an epidemic you know that the the rates of this are you know in the double digits etc um but i think that that's that aside, I think for people that do, and for men that do, men and women, but for, for men that do struggle with this, I think it's, it's right that we um, appropriately um, destigmatize some of this stuff. I say appropriately because I think, uh, I've talked about this in a previous podcast, but there's, I think there are inappropriate ways to destigmatize mental health, and I think that happens a lot, unfortunately. And so I think appropriately would be, you know, some version of, you know, doing it with the right kind of person, you know, with a mental health professional or a clinician, um, you know, confiding to people you can trust, you know, being able to uh, have a space where you can express your thoughts and feelings, um, et cetera. And, and so I think we need to, to promote that in, in positive and, and healthy ways. Yeah, I, so, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. So on the, so just moving uh, kind of through the disorder and then we'll get to some of your stuff. Um, so I just mentioned this. So the, the prevalence for this, when I was looking up the data is about two and a half in the U S population, um, percent, two and a half percent. And I think it's on a 50, 50 on the gender side of things and just under 2% in the world. So, you know, I guess one thing about it is, is that, you know, two, two and a half percent might seem really low and it is, but if you take a country like the United States, you know, it's 330 million people at least, that's still a lot of people that are going to have this. You know, we're talking, you know, thousands of people that are going to have this disorder. And <laughs> excuse me, are you, you're closer to this than I am, obviously. 
in any of the literature with the epidemiology uh, rates, do you see any of cases rising? Uh, is it misdiagnosed as something else and then it goes unseen? Or do we see this? I mean, I don't want it to rise, but are, are we, if we're getting more accurately, or excuse me, more accurate diagnoses, um, do we see the number climbing or it kind of stays the same? Or, or uh, And you can talk about how it is in the UK. If you don't know US numbers, that's fine. But how do your, what, what's your kind of uh, read on the, the current epidemiological reach? Yeah, I can't really comment on whether or not it's increased. I think the literature that I see always reports that same 2% figure. Um, and I don't know if that's because of the lack of literature or because um, there haven't really been any more any recent studies on you know worldwide prevalence. But um, one thing I would say, which you've touched on before, is that it does go underreported because a lot of people don't want to come forward to talk about it. There's a lot of shame attached to the disorder and a lot of stigma as well. Um, people, and one of the main concerns that people have is that if they open up and share what they're experiencing, people will just invalidate them or think that they are vain. And it's the complete opposite. Having BDD doesn't make you vain. You don't like how you look. And a lot of people um, don't seem to grasp that, which is really unfortunate. I think that for, I hope uh, listeners are sort of kind of getting a flavor or recognizing how difficult this is to recognize and even for clinicians um, and and much more so for kind of just the average layperson. There are certainly people that are vain, <laughs> right? There are certainly people that are, you know, kind of, and, you know, there might be some underlying, you know, you know, mild, if you will, pathology there. Maybe they, you know, certain the way they were raised or something like that or some of their exposure, but it doesn't mean that they have a disorder necessarily, right? But either way, there are people that are like that. You know, there's a little bit of some narcissism, a little bit of some, some vanity. Okay, but they're, they're not, they don't have a disorder, right? They're not doing repetitive checks. They don't have these internal compulsions. You know, it's not, it's not at that, it's not at the, what we'd say, clinical threshold, right? It's not at a clinical mm -hmm. level, um, right? And, and so, I mean, that does exist. But so then it is hard when you, when you see sometimes, um, um, for other people, all they see is behaviors, right? They don't know what's going inside the person. And so when you see behaviors that just on the outside can look kind of this non-clinical, you know, just a little vanity kind of thing. And then the other person that literally has very analogous behaviors um, or, or synonymous behaviors, it can be hard to know, okay, well, we don't want to pathologize somebody, but we also don't want to miss uh, some of these things. And so and that's very challenging. That is, that is extremely challenging um, for, like, like I said, clinicians, much less, you know, for, for common folks. So is there anything you want to say in terms of how the behaviors present with these kind of uh, aspects that, you know, how can we catch it so it's not underdiagnosed? Um, how do we, what are ways, I guess, for clinicians, and then if you guess you want to say, like, you know, friends or, or colleagues or something, how, how, do we, how do we kind of not miss it but not over pathologize? Yeah, I think I think one of the main challenges with BDD, and I know loads of clinicians want to be able to spot it more easily and to understand how they could go about diagnosing somebody with it, but a lot of people with BDD don't present themselves to clinicians. They won't go and seek help from a mental health professional. Yeah. Their first port of call is to go to a cosmetic setting whether that's a cosmetic surgeon mm. or, or somebody that's going to perform a skin treatment, dermatologist, a dentist, whoever it may be, they mm. will go to them first because to them the defect is so real and it's, yeah. it's definitely there, it's tangible to them. So they may be that's, thinking. Uh, yeah, sorry. That's a really hard, that is really, <laughs> that is very, uh, difficult because for two reasons. So uh, we'll get to the cosmetic piece in a minute, but <laughs> I mean, those folks are in there to make money. I mean, they're not there to be checking mental health necessarily. I mean, they might say they do, but I I'm not putting my trust in stock in, in <laughs> you know, a, a cosmetic surgeon screening for mental health. I'm just personally, I wouldn't, maybe I'm wrong on that, but uh, I, I wouldn't. 
Um, and I think it's a, I think it's a big ask for dermatologists or dentists or et cetera to, to kind of catch this stuff too. However, on, on the more medical side of things, so, you know, kind of with, you know, dentists and dermatologists, you know, there could, this, this could just kind of have the kind of, uh, argument for even more multidisciplinary types of crossover, right? That nothing is like, you could be a specialist, right? You could be a dermatologist, right? That's fine. And you're a specialist in that and great, but also being able to have elements of, of how you're able to screen for some of that stuff, you know, especially if you're in that, you know, if, if I'll just stick with dermatology, because that's easy. If you're a dermatologist, you should probably know, and maybe they do some, some, some uh, training programs do this and I, I'm unaware of it or, 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 or certain, you know, um, residencies or things like that. But there's probably a handful of mental challenges and disorders that are going to be a little bit more common for dermatologists and others. So you're probably not going to, if you're a dermatologist, you're probably not going to see someone that has schizophrenia. It's very unlikely. Um, but yeah, eating disorders, you know, OCD, body dysmorphic, um, et cetera. There's probably some that are going to, you know, kind of come more often. And so that we're just, we're, you and I are just making a good plug for how we need to have more multidisciplinary kinds of, uh, crossover and overlap. So. Yeah, I, I think so. But again, it's, um, some people with BDD as well, are. I don't want to say good at that's not the right phrase, but they keep it to themselves so well mm. that it, again might might be a challenge for dermatologists and cosmetic surgeons to mm -hmm. to pick up on the behaviors sure. that they are trained to recognize. So again, that can present another challenge too. It really is it's such a, an internal issue. Yeah. And it just depends on whether the person wants to open up. But as you said, I think we need to be able to create a society, create environments where people feel comfortable enough to open up yeah it's all well, about that we didn't mention it just because it's you know it's kind of more in the weeds of sorts but there are three other specifiers just to kind of note the what you're saying so people can be diagnosed with body dysmorphic disorder and they can have uh with good or fair insight with poor insight or with absent insight and slash delusional beliefs so sometimes that's just kind of like a another descriptor to say mm. this person has this disorder and they kind of know it and they're pretty insightful or they have very poor insight into it or et cetera. So sometimes that can be helpful too. Um, so I guess one of these things here is that the, the mean onset is 15. Um, and when I was looking this up and, 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 and this seems to be pretty much implicated or, or, it's noticed uh, heavily in terms of when, when it's uh, kind of starts, if you will, or when, when you kind of recognize it in late adolescence, mid to late adolescence. Um, what, what can you, what can you say about that? Um, and are there any uh, social factors that contribute to adolescence kind of first having the onset of, of this disorder? What, what is some of the ideas behind that? Uh, yes. I'd say even though the, the mean onset is 15. There are some children who are extremely young who experience uh, this disorder. They might have come across certain events or mm. experiences in their life that contribute to this. I know from um, interviews that I've done with my participants, a lot of them have said that they were bullied or abused in childhood. Mm. And this happened way before the age of 15. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's it's important to i know a lot of people think that teenagers in particular are very self-conscious about their appearance and they're mm -hmm. sensitive about their appearance whether that's due to going through puberty or being around their peers at school and drawing comparisons between mm -hmm. their appearance and others but i think it's really important to look at the whole childhood not just teenage years things that happened before um some things that I've picked up on in my research is that um, participants have reported being bullied, whether that's by peers, by family members even, uh, family members criticising their appearance or comparing their appearance to other family members' appearances. Um, 
sexual, physical and emotional abuse as well, um, all key contributing factors, I would say. Um, emotional abuse was quite prevalent in my data mm. for um, contributing towards the development of BDD. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm listening to this and like, I'm just, it's very hard to be optimistic about any of this stuff because, <laughs> oh my goodness, like it's, you you have you you kind of mentioned it you have kind of your um normative developmental uh aspects in adolescence right they're very self focused they're trying to figure out who they are you know just adolescence is a shit time right it's not a fun time it sucks i mean my adolescence was fine, but you know, I, I had years or moments where it's just, you know, it sucks. It's not a fun time. You're in the in-between. It's a long time uh, from an evolutionary perspective. You know, there's some things that are just kind of normative, right? But then you put this top spin of past abuse or neglect or et cetera. And it is in general, very difficult to quantify, catch, or, or label, you know, emotional abuse in, in general from parents, from siblings, from peers, <coughs> excuse me, et cetera. And it, it's, a really t it's, a, it's a really difficult thing because each person is different. And so we don't, I don't think that the, 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 the fix for this is to just make people in places where they are extremely protected and extremely safe and like they never say anything. Like there is an element of learning how to deal with tough experiences and tough moments. Um, but I think when you're talking about long term chronic emotional abuse, especially from people that are supposed to make you feel safe. So I'm thinking really of kind of parents or in the, in the house. That's super hard. And you have no idea. I, I tell this to, 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 to clients often, um, especially when I do work with either couples or families. You don't know the impact of what you're doing now five, ten years from now. You don't know. It could be so many things. It could be so many potential things. And that's not to beat up parents or make them feel bad. But we have to, I mean, parents have a huge, huge, huge responsibility. They have to do much better at... Um, a much better job of, of, of making sure that they have good boundaries, but also a, a, a healthy uh, sense of security and safety emotionally for each person. And when that doesn't happen, you know, you're, you're, you're really setting a, a course potentially for, you know, there, there's, they're going down a path that when you get up to a certain bend, you know, there's like six different ways it could go. You know, do they have a personality disorder? Do they develop addictions? Do they develop body image issues? Do they develop, I mean, there's so many, or just this kind of chronic, you know, negative interpersonal romantic relationships. There's so many ways that could impact, you know, or, or all of them. And so, yes, it, it is, uh, yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's really, really, really messy, really, really complicated to, to, to hear how adolescence, just there's a normal nonsense of adolescence and then this kind of added layer um, yeah, this is very, uh, <laughs> not hopeful. Um, I guess that also goes to some of the ideology, right? Which was, we've already kind of talked about is most people or the research show that the, the origins or where this body dysmorphic disorder come from is from childhood abuse and neglect. Um, uh, maybe there's some genetic proneness from relatives that have OCD, but is there any other things that we know about the etiology and, and where, uh, body dysmorphic disorder kind of originate from? Yeah, um, just picking up on that as well, I mentioned bullying quite passively, but I think that is one of the really key issues that young people face today. Um, there was a study in 2018, I think it was the Be Real campaign in the UK, and they found that 55% of young people aged between 11 and 16 were being bullied. So over half of children in the UK will experience bullying in their time at school. And that was fo focusing on their physical appearance as well. Oh, okay. I was going to ask, I, 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 I 
mostly agree with the campaigns, at least in the U.S., and I know it's U.K. too, of, you know, anti-bullying stuff. I think it's in some ways gone pre a little more extreme of, like, just trying to make everything this, like, safe bubble, which I don't think is always so good. But, okay, I'll take it if, you know, we aren't really harming people. But I was going to ask, how do, they, how do they define the bullying? Because that has become a very broad term. You know, it could be... And again, it's just every kid is different, right? But, you know, a little teasing could be really catastrophic for one child and be like nothing for another child. So, but you're talking about on the, at least specifically on bullying about physical appearance uh, yeah. or, or how yeah. their body looks or their face or things like that. Okay, that's, that's, that's helpful. Um, so, so bullying is one of these things that is a contributor. What are some of the other contributors to, you know, etiology or anything else outside of, uh, of that piece? I think as well, um, you mentioned some of the biological, um, yeah, sorry, etiology. Mm -hmm. One thing that uh, my participants have mentioned, not all of them, quite a small amount, talked about um, learned behaviours from parents. So watching their parents engage in behaviours mm -hmm. like this, excessive grooming mm -hmm. or criticising their own appearance in front of their children mm -hmm. is something that mm -hmm. could be considered as a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. towards um because then it will encourage the children to look at themselves critically as well mm. and you know if they look like their parents think about whether their parents is criticizing their appearance indirectly these are all issues that are really hard hard to quantify but we need to learn more about them in order yeah. to understand it further yeah i've I've had clients as adults that will come and tell me just from their parents, both what was told to them and then what they observed as kids about this, this, this in, you know, ridiculous and insane uh, overemphasis on appearance. It's just, you know, I, I, I sometimes will, will sit, you know, baffled at, you know, some of the stuff in which, and, 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 and that it's very commonplace. You know, why does your hair look like that? Why are you dressed this way? Why are you, you know, it's just, just on, on, on. And I think there's, there's some, again, there's a healthy element of trying to be presentable if you're going out to, you know, a family event or function, you know, or you don't want kids going around in pajamas all the time or something like, I, I mean, there's a, there's a normal kind of uh, piece to this, but what I'm talking about is just, you know, absolutely just emotionally abusive just very 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 hypercritical of their kids and a lot of that's <laughs> excuse me just a projection um of their own uh, uh preoccupations etc so it's it, I, I have heard this uh, clinically and it's it always makes me very sad when i hear it and, and that people have to live with that you know their whole lives and you know they're dismissing it or they're saying like oh that's not a big deal you know it's just you know or or that can't possibly impact how I'm how things are for me now, and and we 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 see that so. Yeah, and I'd add as well from partners too, from from people <clears throat> you expect <throat> to love and protect you, You're right, right, and and not treat you in that way as well. Mm -hmm, I'd mm -hmm. say in in my data, it, um, participants mentioned having abusive partners, mm. partners criticizing their appearance and making comparisons with other people as well, which is again really damaging. Yeah. 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 That's, I think it's the hardest well, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to put a, a hierarchy to it, but I, I definitely think it is hard when it's coming from uh, figures that are supposed to be loving, supportive in your corner. And, and they're the ones that are doing the most, you know, some, some of the mm. most harmful kinds of ways of doing this. So I guess um, I want to talk about we can we can talk about it here because I, I want to I want to get to it in terms of we've we've touched on a little bit. And so what do we have to say about uh, cosmetics, uh, plastic surgery? Um, oh, my goodness. I mean, we could probably spend an hour talking about this stuff. I mean, this, this stuff is really. <sighs> I don't. I. I don't have a lot of good things to say about it. I mean, I mean, no. in terms of in terms of the standards. I mean, if I try in my hardest to do it, I. I think uh, plastic surgery or cosmetics. I think, in in many ways, my understanding of of what its uh, origins were was for people that have you know significant disfigurement because of an injury or 
you know, something like that. It, it's wonderful, I think, in that way. And I think that's uh, its true intention is, is good for that. And I think people or people that have had um, like women that have had uh, double mastectomies and then they're able to to have uh, implants. I think that's really good for, you know, um, for some people that can be a really positive thing. And so, I, you know, there's many injuries, things like that. There's many things in which, you know, cosmetics and plastic surgery is is good. Um, I don't know anything outside of that, though, that is, that is uh, really positive. I, I read an article uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, oh, I'm going to forget where it was. Oh, gosh, it's going to kill me now. I want to say The Atlantic. Don't anybody, any, anybody that works at The Atlantic, don't kill me. Um, I, maybe it's not. Maybe it was uh, New Yorker. I don't remember where it was. It's one of these, one of these places that talked about this... Um, uh, how many this impact of uh, Instagram and then uh, plastic surgery where there's this strange effect happening where all women are kind of looking very similar um, in many ways. They're, they're getting certain the similar things done to their, to their lips and their nose and their cheeks and uh, things on their face and that it's, it's becoming very strange in some ways. And so mm. I, I'm not doing justice to the article. It's, it's much more <laughs> thoughtful, but um, yeah. So what do you want to say about how the impact of cosmetics and plastic surgery? And, and then I guess we can talk a little bit about social media if you want, but um, how is that contributing or impacting uh, by dysmorphic disorder and, and all the rest? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll start off with the social media point of view. And I, I have to warn you, I have some strong views on, on this. Okay. I, okay. I, I don't like the way that people um, try and blame social media for the development of body image issues and mm -hmm. BDD. I, I think it plays a part in worsening pre-existing body image issues mm. and BDD in mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. But I, I really don't think it causes it. And the reason I say that is because, I mean, the first documented case of BDD was in 1891, mm. so 1800s, um, by an Italian psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. But social media didn't exist back then at all. Mm -hmm. And this is where I think it becomes quite problematic that BDD seems to be portrayed as a brand new phenomenon that is caused by social media and getting excessive cosmetic surgery. And it's not the case at all. I think people then completely overlook all of the things we've talked about previously, the bullying, emotional abuse, physical, sexual abuse that are contributing to it. And then it just becomes this sort of freak show, the way that people present it in the media. So it's really poor. And then people that live with BDD think that they have to have that extreme appearance in order to qualify to have it. And it's not the case. Can, can I push back on that a little bit? Just a little bit. Yeah. I agree. I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, it's definitely a thing. It's, it's definitely, I don't, I don't think, I don't think this for anything. I don't think one thing causes another thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't. So I'm not going to sit here and beat up social media and say, you know, uh, uh, people on Instagram, are seeing this and then 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 they all of a sudden have uh, a disorder. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Um, I guess my slight pushback here is, is that there is a difference between. So I'm going to pick on Instagram a little bit because I know it's it, it pulls for this stuff more than Facebook or Twitter. or You know, I guess you could maybe throw in their uh, Snapchat or something, but. Instagram really does kind of pull this out, I, 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 I gather, but maybe people can disagree. But um, there's a difference between, okay, it's a variable that impacts maybe some of this stuff, um, and having more of a, I guess you could say, active kind of uh, correlation. So here's what I mean. Sure. You can go all the way back 120 years ago where we see these things and throughout time, when, if you look at the history of this, I'm sure that there's many documented cases. And I'm sure you can go to you know, the 1980s, uh, the 1990s. But I would say from 2010 um, and after, 
definitely after 2015, you have a generation of, of uh, young people that are you know, having Instagram accounts as early as six, seven, eight, nine, definitely by puberty, you know, 12, 13. I mean, you know, again, not every child, but most in Western societies or, or in uh, um, you know, major countries that have access to uh, um, you know, phones and digital and social media. That's very different in my view than um, old people like me who can remember a time before there was the internet, um, with way before there was social media and all that stuff. Absolutely, there's always going to be um, standards of beauty, so it's quote unquote from whether it's whatever medium, right? I, I, and so I don't, that's always been, you know, TV, uh, commercials, advertisements, magazines, etc. That that's always going to have a, a a layer there, but it is a little different where you can have a mini computer in your hands, in your iPhone, and you can literally just hit two two times on the screen and you scrolling and seeing all of this stuff. And there are kids. Uh, I mean, I I remember when my my daughter was in elementary school. You know, I mean, there were her peers, I mean, she did not, but her peers had Instagram and, and better iPhones than I did, you know, at nine years old, nine and 10 years old. That is much different in terms of correlatory value and impact on how you're viewing your body and how you're viewing quote unquote other peers um, on social media than I was at nine or 10 years old. I, I, am I... Am I wrong on this? Do you disagree with me on this? Or, or, or how, can you, how, can we, how, can we, how can we understand the uniqueness of the, some uniqueness of, yeah. of the specific yeah. things in the current moment based on kind of some of the things I've said? I do agree with you. And I know, I know there are plenty of children that use Instagram and various of the social media forms and have iPhones and everything. But I think that there is a danger of people taking that and running with it and then just saying social media causes all of these body image issues, which to some extent it might do, but I think that it's really important not to ignore all of the other things that contribute to it as certainly, well. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. I would, I don't think we're disagreeing on, on that piece of it. Mm. I might be putting more, <laughs> I might be putting more emphasis on how much it, impacts and contributes to already existing uh, predispositions, if you will. I, I don't, I think it, I, I don't think it's very helpful. I think it can exacerbate things. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. think, even if you have a, a, an Instagram account at seven years old and you're looking at all this stuff, I don't think that causes any disorder. I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. I'm just saying, I think that it, um, I think it's a, it's, a net negative, if you will, in my mind. I don't think it's a very positive thing for very young people to be exposing themselves to many of those things so early on. I, I just see it as a as another negative contribution yeah. to to many of those those aspects. And I and I know that that's I I know I'm coming down hard on on social media, and I and I always say this anytime I bring it up. I'm not anti social media. I think there's some really really awesome aspects to it. Um, I do. Um, so I know it, it seems like I'm kind of this old person that's like, oh, kids with these, you know, you know, iPhone. I'm really not like that, I promise. But I do get worried about and, and again, I'm not saying I know some people do this. They they like to talk about these things as causing, and I'm not saying that either. I just think it's a negative contribution for this particular issue. Hmm. Is, yeah. is, is my yeah. and then another thing as well that um that I see quite a lot of which again, it's really unhelpful. Um, new new words for body dysmorphic, well, then it's not another word for body dysmorphic disorder, but I see things like Zoom dysmorphia and Snapchat dysmorphia. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, we're, and, we're, uh -huh. Yeah, and, and those terms are really, really unhelpful. Uh -huh. yeah. When you think of that in, term, in comparison to Mm -hmm. the term body dysmorphic disorder, body dysmorphia, because they sound so similar, they just get lumped together. 
Yeah, I, I'm with you on that 100. percent I, I don't like the kind of colloquialisms. I don't like the, you know, people will I, again. <coughs> excuse me. I've talked about this um, in a few other podcasts where it's, you know, people will say like, oh, you know, this person's bipolar because they, you know, or oh, that must be my OCD kicking up, or you know, I, I don't like when people do that mm. um, because it's it's minimizing. I think it's unintentionally insensitive, but I mean, it's at the very least, it's not accurate. And I think we need to not use that in kind of these colloquial terms. They need, you can use something else for that, but I think it is a little bit, um, it's, it's definitely inaccurate and not helpful for understanding. No, no, no. This is a serious, I mean, people do this with like, oh, it must be my, my ADD kicking up. And it's like, no, ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder. You don't have a neurodevelopmental disorder and you don't want one, you know, and I don't know. And this is kind of what I was saying earlier, where when things get too destigmatized, I think in a, in a negative way, that's what, that's what can tend to happen. People hear it all the time. They're always hearing it. And then it's like, oh yeah, yeah, this is kind of normative and it's almost too normative. And we mm. need to make a distinction between uh, non-pathological and pathological kinds of symptoms with, for, for folks. Cause then it's going to minimize when someone does say, yeah, I have OCD. Then the other person will be like, Oh yeah, I have some of those symptoms too sometimes. And it's like, no, this is completely different. It was just, it's wildly different um, in many ways. And so I, I totally agree with you on, on, yeah. on confabulating terms like that. So it's not very well, helpful. Well, people use it in the, in research articles. I've seen actual research articles published using oh, those yes. terms. And it's, it's really, really unhelpful. Uh, I just want to say before we move to the uh, plastic surgery piece of it, uh, mm. just to correct myself, I, I found the, the article. It's in the New Yorker. It's a couple years old. Um, I guess it's almost two years old now. Uh, it's uh, the age of Instagram face, how social media face tune and plastic surgery create a single cyborgian look. It's a very long article in the New Yorker. Uh, I might post it in the notes, but it's interesting how that has become more and more of a thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think as well that the danger with um, putting a bit too much emphasis on social media and uh, having cosmetic surgery to look a certain way, to, to look more like, as you said, how some women choose to look today. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a danger of excluding older people with mm -hmm. BDD, because yeah. there, are, there are plenty of older people who, who have this that don't use social media mm -hmm. and they, they don't have cosmetic surgery and fillers to look a certain way. And, and I think those people are completely disregarded in the research. The very young and the older are disregarded mm -hmm. in this research. That, that's a really good point. Yeah, I'm glad you bring that up. That's a really, really good point. I think maybe sometimes people, you know, they look at... You know, when we talked about the mean onset is 15 and that this is very much a late adolescence, early uh, adulthood thing. But also there are people that you're right, have lived a long time with this and they're not impacted or influenced. They might, they might not even be on social media. Um, so I think that's a that's a really good point. So tell me real quick and then we can we can move on to some of your research specifically, which I'm, I'm really excited to hear about um, what. Um, what are your ideas, I guess, about uh, cosmetics and plastic surgery and um, I guess certain types of, uh, you know, makeup lines? Things like, what, what are your mm -hmm. kind of thoughts about how this, I guess in general, but really how it, it interacts, if you will, with um, you know, by this morphic disorder? I think there are, there has been more of an increase in advertisements for cosmetic surgery over the years. Um, I remember when I was younger, I used to look through my mum's magazines, which weren't about cosmetic surgery, but in the back there would be loads of adverts for cosmetic surgery, phone numbers for clinics and you know offers, advertisements and things. And in some ways that was easier to just put to one side because it's a magazine, you close it and think, oh, I'm not meant to look at that, that's not for me. But when people are bombarded with those advertisements online, I mean, you could be looking at a news article and it'll come up on the side of a cosmetic surgery clinic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you'll, you'll be more exposed to things like that that you might not have normally been thinking about. I think that can sometimes have an effect on people in that it would could make them start to look at themselves more critically 
and think about, well, if I could have something done, I might have this, I might have that. But again, I don't think, I think there's a danger of, again, assuming that lots of people with BDD have cosmetic surgery. As I mentioned at the beginning, I don't know anyone that can afford it. Yeah, I, no, it's I really, very expensive. It's, it's extremely expensive. And so I think a lot of people with BDD have to do other things to, to try and cope with the condition. Like I said, with camouflaging, wearing clothes in a certain way. Mm. Um, some people with BDD even, even do self-surgery, which is horrific. Mm. Um, and it's also called DIY surgery as well where they can't afford a procedure, they might do it themselves or they might deliberately um, self-mutilate so that they have to then be operated on to repair that. And I think this this is another part of BDD that is not looked at enough. There isn't a huge amount of research. I know David Beale has done research on this. Um, I think he might have coined the term DIY surgery, mm. but it's it's not it's not really reported enough not enough in my opinion it's very serious hmm. yeah that's uh, very um alarming and and disconcerting to hear that i mean i mean and dangerous i mean quite frankly um and you know in that in that way i think it just tells you again this is a serious it can it can be in some ways a very serious disorder and 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 something that we need to to have better treatment for and to not take lightly um two quick points here is how do we understand some of the comorbidity with uh, that body dysmorphic disorder has with something like depression or anxiety um and how does that you know these are Depression and anxiety are the, probably the most common things that people will see, the clinicians or or even, you know, <clears throat> you may have friends or family that say that they have, you know, they take medication or they go to therapy for depression. It's a very common um, thing, um, but how does having uh, body dysmorphic disorder kind of sit with, you know, kind of comorbidly with some of the more common disorders? Yeah, well, it, it is certainly comorbid with depression and social anxiety. Um but again, I think it it's hard for people to open up about having these issues. Mm -hmm. I think depression and social anxiety are more talked about today. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with Mental Health Awareness Week and things like that. I think that people should care about mental health all through the year, not just in one particular sure. week. Sure. Um, but I think people do speak more openly about depression and social anxiety more than body dysmorphic disorder. I never see people talking no. about BDD during those weeks or, I mean, even when people, when people are running mental health campaigns and making people aware of specific mental health conditions, BDD is never on the list. Mm -hmm. no, it's, never, it's never mentioned. There's many disorders that never make it. You yeah. probably only really hear about depression, anxiety, maybe sometimes eating disorders, maybe sometimes bipolar, and that's about it. I mean, those are the big ones, maybe because they're just more prevalent, but um, <clears throat> yeah, there's so, so many that are, you know, really um, impairing and, and yeah. also need to be, I think, discussed as well. And I think, again, that might contribute to why it has such a low prevalence because people are living with it but don't know it mm -hmm. exists or mm -hmm. don't know what the symptoms are and what to look out for. Yeah. Uh, one last quick thing on this uh, before we move on is there's some interesting... I went, I went back and looked at this. There's some interesting uh, cultural-related diagnostic issues with... Um, uh, body dysmorphic disorder. And, and this isn't true for all disorders. So that's the only reason I'm just kind of flagging it here just to see if you have any, any thoughts on it. But some of them are, I'm going to get these names wrong, so forgive me, but Taijin Kayofusho and uh, Shubo Kayofu and also Koro. So these are Japanese terms. Um, and they have, there's a, in some disorders, um, there's something that we kind of 
we have that, at least the, the APA, American Psychiatric Association, that creates the DSM, wants to sometimes make a distinction between a disorder and sometimes what we call like a cultural syndrome. Um, and that's kind of what, this, what these are. Um, so, you know, that there's a type of, you know, the phobia of a deformed body or, and that there's some cultural element. So it's kind of the DSM's way of trying to be culturally sensitive of saying, hey, we don't want to pathologize something that has some cultural implications, which is fair to do. Um, and so I know it's not uh, widely, you know, studied and researched, but is there anything that you want to say about any of, whether it's these or any of the potentially cultural aspects of how people look at the body in other cultures? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not familiar with those terms myself. Um, I know of them, but I don't think I can speak about them because I, I haven't done sure, any research sure. on those. But one thing that I can say is that I know in um, East Asian countries, mostly Japan, South Korea, um, a lot of people that have cosmetic surgery because it's just uh, part of the culture. Mm. It's it's like, very acceptable to go and have a cosmetic procedure. Some people even view it as a rite of passage. Mm. Um, when you become an adult, you go and have a cosmetic procedure. And I think, again, that could that could create issues there. Like we talked about before with family members during... Mm we're making criticisms about appearance or there's that expectation that you would have a cosmetic procedure going into adulthood mm. that could create some serious problems there. But I don't feel that I'm able to talk about that too much because I know in the West it's completely different. It's, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I also am like zero <laughs> competence to talk about that. Um, but I think I only bring it up because I think that I just hope listeners take away that this stuff, you know, body dysmorphic disorder is complicated and it's, it's nuanced and it's messy and it's not straightforward and it looks and presents differently in other places. And how can you do that respectfully uh, in a way that's culturally sensitive? And, you know, I, I think that there's, you know, this is always a kind of a, a, a kind of a throwaway line, but there's just a case for doing more research and to understanding more about how, how do everything, but how do certain disorders um, translate or manifest in other parts of the world? It, it might not be a disorder, right? And so we, that can be really hard, I think, for people in the West to kind of be like, this is a huge issue and we call this pathological, but in other parts of the world, it may not be. I, I had a, <clears throat> a conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago, I don't remember what it was, when I talked about menopause with uh, a historian. She wrote a book on menopause and she basically, hmm, you know, kind of leans on, you know, menopause might just be a cultural syndrome for us in the West, just like there's cultural syndromes for people in the East. Um, and it's an interesting hypothesis. It's an interesting idea. And uh, she lays it out. Um, Quite nicely. It definitely gave me stuff to think about and say, oh, this is very fascinating. So, you know, I wonder if there's there's things like that and just that starts to kind of dip into, you know, anthropology and things like that. So, <clears throat> OK, now let's let's move on to kind of your research in particular. Um, so maybe what we can do is we can. Um, you can just give me. I'll give you some runway here and you can just go and just tell me, just tell me. So what was your dissertation on? I, I know you wrote a, a, a pretty awesome one. You know, what, give us the title. What was it on? Uh, what were you trying to do? And just give us the full, uh, you know, at the very least, the abstract or the cliff notes of, of, yeah. of your dissertation. So, so run with it. Bit of a long title. <laughs> Try Good, I like long titles. <laughs> go, go ahead. Go ahead. It's. The title is An Exploration of the Experience of Living with Body Dysmorphic Disorder Using Multimodal Hermeneutic Phenomenological Approaches and Interpretative Phenomenological Analysis. <laughs> so for me, for people like me, that's the, that's the one I'm picking up and I'm reading. So maybe not for other people, but that's the one I'm picking up and reading. So, okay, explain what all that is to listeners and, and why you decided to take this approach and, and what you did and what you found, all that good stuff. Okay. 
Well, I decided to take the multimodal approach. Um, by multimodal, I mean it's not just focusing on people's narratives. I asked people to produce artwork and written pieces and poetry and all kinds of creative methods that anybody could use to express what they were going through. Um, I combined that with interpretative phenomenolo phenomenological analysis, which I'll just call IPA for now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that is a, a research, a qualitative research approach that seeks to help us uh, make sense of participants making sense of their experiences. So I thought that was a, the perfect way really to gain a deeper understanding of this phenomenon, because it's really under research as we've established. And I think qualitative research is the way to get people to take notice and gain more of an understanding of what it's like for an everyday person with BDD. Yeah, so I think the the thing here that's really um, it makes a lot of sense in my mind, especially you know for the first you know um, part of the conversation that it can be really hard. Well, I think it's hard in both ways, right? But and but also different. <laughs> it can be hard to get quantitative data because, um, you know, it, uh, the low rates. You know, two percent. A lot of people probably aren't doing a lot of research grants and funding for you know a, a disorder that has low uh, prevalency, et cetera. I wonder what the measures are for trying to get quantitative data, but in a different way. I think it's also very difficult to get qualitative data because as you said very, very well in the beginning, a lot of this stuff is very, very internal. It's, it's very, very internal and it's not the same obviously for everybody. And how, how do we measure that? How do we, how do we excavate that? How do we uncover that from a person of what their internal, um, you know, framework or heuristics are about their body or about their image or how they're seeing themselves. You can't say, okay, here's a, a standardized, you know, uh, 15 or 20 item questionnaire, you know, answer these and then everything we know about it. I mean, that's helpful to do in some ways, but it's not, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of gaps there. You're not going to get a lot. And, and, uh, and I think people still have this very annoying debate about, you know, quantitative versus qualitative and, you know, get people that like one more than the other. And again, I, I'm not trying to both sides it, but I think it's, we need both. And I do think for some things we do need one more than the other. And I would say because of say, unlike something like depression or anxiety, um, I think for body dysmorphic disorder, it is very internal. And so getting at the qualitative uh, aspects of it, I think could probably tell you more. They're just extremely hard to code and then put out and then interpret and then write write about. And so, you know, more power to you for, for, for doing that. That stuff is really, really tedious and really difficult. So um, I don't know if you want to say anything about that but before I have the, the next question. But Yeah, I mean, it, it was um, quite a challenge at times to get people to open up about what they were going through, um, which is why I decided to bring in the creative methods element, because I didn't initially plan to do that. Mm. Um, that was something that came from two empirical studies that I did. Mm -hmm. And I thought, let's introduce some artwork, let's help people actually express visually mm -hmm. what they are experiencing inside. Yeah. And I thought that would be a better way of helping people without BDD to understand what it's like to have. Yeah. What, um, so that's the kind of multimodal piece. What about the hermeneutical? Uh, that might be a yeah. strange <laughs> word for some people. Um, and uh, the phenomenological. Um, again, might be a strange word for people. Uh, probably not my listeners, because I've talked about phenomenology I don't even know how many hours I've talked about it now on the podcast, but w w kind of explain those terms and, and what they mean and then why you were uh, using them here. Yeah, I mean, the, the importance of hermeneutics in, in this context um, was to just say really that I'm offering my own interpretation of 
my participants' experiences. So while I try to make sure that they're authentic and I, I speak to my participants and check things with them and, you know, going through interviews and back and forth with emails, I like to clarify that I've understood them correctly. Um, hermeneutics is a really useful way of just gaining other additional insights into the experience to try and make it a richer overall understanding a richer picture really of mm. what what it means to have bdd yeah and the phenomenological component yeah. tell, tell us about that piece i didn't know where to begin with that that's all all the way through <laughs> yeah, all yeah. the way through the work um well i decided to use i decided to take this sort of approach because it hadn't been done before firstly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um there has been some work previously on BDD and uh, philosophy and phenomen phenomenology, but they didn't use empirical data. Mm -hmm. And so this was quite novel. Um, I think it worked really well. I know I'm biased because it's my own work. <laughs> <I think. laughs> That's okay. You can be biased for your own work. <laughs> but I think it, it worked, it worked really well in being able to make external something that is so private and internal for so many people yes. um, and some of the concepts just made it so much easier to explain mm. and it, it gave me lots of different thoughts and ideas about how we could go about taking this further as well mm -hmm. yeah no I, I think that that's right i think that again i'll just you know kind of emphasize i think that for for people that have a, 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 a disorder that specifically is, uh, or, or many times very internal, I think you would want to try and get at that. Now, <clears throat> I read your paper, uh, using artwork and interpretive phenomenological analysis to explore the experience of coping with body dysmorphic disorder. Is this uh, a piece of like your, your dissertation research or did this happen before and then you did your dissertation? I guess the timeline of this I mean, not necessarily publishing and stuff, but just where on the timeline uh, with this paper and is it connected directly or linked, uh, kind of hyperlinked yes. directly to your dissertation? H explain that. <clears throat> um, well, that particular article is just one case study from um, the art study that I included in my thesis. So in mm. some ways it is, it is part of a chapter. In, in the my, paper, my you my mentioned thesis, four themes. But it only focuses um, on one participant. Uh, uh, whereas tell I me if I get this wrong. Several uh, others one's life the, world, detachment, the distancing, piece. fragment itself. Okay. And then so, reconciling self and body. Um, maybe you could just explain what each of those are and then how that fits into kind of your conceptualization or framework of what you were trying to do uh, in understanding. Uh, yeah. BD. Yeah, so those four themes were from the wider chapter. Mm -hmm. In that uh, smaller paper that you've got, I think I only drew upon two, I believe. Uh -huh. But I can, I can talk about the four uh, Please, yeah. today with you. Mm -hmm. The first one was the integration of BDD with the life world. So by life world, I mean the uh, environment, relationships, everything that is involved in an individual's life but it's just compressed into the world, world, life world. And in that theme, it was um, things like becoming, BDD becoming inseparable from the individual. There became times in participants' lives where they felt that they couldn't distinguish between where the disorder ended and where their, their own sense of self was. Yeah. And so it sort of became synonymous with them. Um, one participant spoke about a constant background noise, BDD being a um, constant background noise mm. in their life, which I thought was really fascinating. And that's not something that I've seen in the data before. Mm. Um, and that was represented in the artwork as well, as well as in the interview. So, okay. So I think we talked about the life world. And so we had the, the other three uh, themes yeah. in the paper. What, what, tell us the other, th uh, um, uh, the next one. Second one was a detachment and distancing of the perceived selves. Mm -hmm. um, and so that one was to do with the individual wanting to detach from um, not just their environment and surroundings and other people, but from, from a part of themselves, from, I call it the BDD self, mm -hmm. their perceived image. Um, and 
all throughout the thesis and work I've done, there's a really clear disconnection between the objective self and the participant's perceived self. And in that image that you mentioned that you saw with the red backdrop, with mm-hmm, the eyes mm-hmm, looking at, mm-hmm, at the mm-hmm. person, that particular participant um, created that image and described that that figure as a monster. The monster is her. Mm-hmm. And she referred to herself as th- the monster, and she is this, she is that. She didn't talk about herself in first person, which was mm-hmm. really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. And I think the artwork was a way of... Um, the participants being able to convey their emotions and thoughts that they might be ashamed of or mm-hmm. feel concerned about sharing in a more protective way. Um, so being able to externalize that and keep it away from the self somehow made it easier for participants to talk about BDD. Mm. Yeah, that's... Mm. Yeah, I, I have a few thoughts, but I'll let you finish yeah. the other two and then we'll, get, we'll, get, well, I'll give you some of my thoughts. <clears throat> And the third theme was the fragmented self. And that uh, draws mainly upon uh, aspects of BDD that really focus on individual parts of the body. So Mm. atomistic viewing, which came through quite strongly in all of my research, being unable to view the body as a whole entity was Mm. the key Mm. um, factor there. And there have been some eye tracking studies as well that have been done um, in recent years, which actually demonstrate that people with BDD have different eye tracking patterns and pathways to people that don't have BDD when they're Mm. viewing themselves. Interesting. And the the fourth one? The fourth one was um, towards a reconciliation of the self and body. So even though it's really distressing and a really horrific thing to experience, um, participants were still able to, um, they called it having hope, they called it a semblance of hope, which was really, really powerful. Mm. Um, and moving towards acceptance of the body. One really fascinating thing somebody said to me was that they're not striving for body positivity, mm. they're striving for body new- neutrality. Mm. So just feeling neutral towards themselves. They don't want to hate themselves or overly love themselves they just don't want to feel anything really towards how they look they just yeah. want to accept it that's, that's that's particularly instructive i think many people would kind of assume or uh, yeah acknowledge that oh it must be body positivity that they win but the fact that body neutrality is the is the goal i think is is a, a very very good distinction it's just very fascinating there so, so with these four themes how do you how did you kind of fit them into your conceptualization of body uh, dysmorphic disorder and and how did you kind of you know what did you do with that how did you understand it to to kind of illuminate more of something we can know about the the disorder uh, through this phenomenological qualitative aspect that hadn't been done in other studies or, or previously how did it help your conceptualization of the disorder as a whole because all of the themes are so different and all of the themes in other studies as well um, are so different. I think it, it um, really helpfully represented how multifaceted BDD is. And you mentioned before that it's a really complex disorder, which, which it definitely is. And I think it really helped to convey that message that it's not just about selfie taking and it's not just about you know looking in the mirror repeatedly. There is so much more involved. And I mentioned that um the term life world as well and i really wanted to bring through how it made it so difficult for people to navigate their own life worlds yeah i i I definitely there's a there's a lot of uh for me the themes kind of open up this these all these other worlds within philosophy and and psychology so i hear and much of what you're saying, um, and I think you, you reference it in the in the paper, so I can we can talk about it here. Um, a lot of Heidegger's philosophy. Um, I hear a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of Merleau Ponty's philosophy. Um, he Merleau Ponty had this really powerful, I think, uh, way of understanding the 
phenomenological experiences that people have through the body. He took a lot of time uh, to technically explain how that is, where we, we go beyond the objective subjective of things, right? And we say, okay, but there's the whole experience of what that is, right? So with the you know, figure, background, and then the subject. But all of those things, there's what the experience of that is like. And, and in his mind, you can't have um, an understanding of, of those. Well, I would say you can't, but the, the most uh, specific way in which we understand that whole experience is through the body. You know, basically, if you were to kind of look at it in an absence, you know, if we didn't have a body and we just had our consciousness, it wouldn't be quite the same. Mm. Right. We need the body. And so the body is super important. Right. And I think he does a nice way of explaining it without. I think he calls it the vehicle. For yeah. It's having, absolutely the vehicle. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but in the in, in the paper somewhere, you talk about Heidegger's uh, concealment and unconcealment. I don't know if you want to chat about that a little bit. Uh, or we can talk about that a little bit about uh, concealment and unconcealment and what, what, what did he mean or how do you understand what he meant by that and how you uh, map that onto some of the uh, um, pieces here for body dysmorphic disorder. Yeah, with the um, concealment was, as we've touched on with the internalized experience, the, the things that we can't see, um, the things that are within ourselves that only we well, we, I was going to say that we understand, but we might not even understand about ourselves, just what we what we know about ourselves. And the, the reason that I decided to use artwork in the studies was to try and get participants to externalize what they were experiencing internally. So from my perspective, I view the artwork as unconcealment. Mm -hmm. So shining a light on what we don't know about what is in darkness and bringing it out into the world and helping mm -hmm. people understand as well and again drawing on heidegger i think of the artwork as an extension of the self mm -hmm. so it's it's what oh, is yes. it's what is inside bringing it outside but it's it's so much more than that it's I've I've gone I've gone a lot into it. If, if you're willing to talk about it with me, Go ahead, no, I was fine. thinking about um, his concept, ready to hand, mm -hmm. and how using the tools, which it could be you know pencil, paintbrush, whatever it is that people mm -hmm. have used mm -hmm. to create their work, is is a fulfillment of that. They're they're putting it on paper and actually using their body to do that, which I think is is amazing. It's not just describing it, they're actually using their body to represent a bodily experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in this type of work and why I think it worked so well with being able to express that for the participants. Yeah. Uh, I, I've talked about this here before, but uh, I'll never miss an opportunity to, to talk about it again. <laughs> I, I do I do like the the the... the um, framework that he gives here. So basically Heidegger's idea was trying to understand about, you know, in, in many ways he, he did phenomenology, he also did existential, uh, existentialism, but he, you know, if you look at phenomenology, it's, you know, to the things themselves, right? You want to get, th th you know, experiences, phenomena, you're trying to explain experience in a way where it goes beyond objective subjective. That's a fine way to understand the world, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, obviously, there there's objective reality. You know, people debate that and stuff, but we can we can say okay, that's there, and we can say there's a subjective experience of that, right? And you know, fine. But what you know, when when you're when you're doing philosophy, you're trying to just get at bottom. Okay, but beyond that, what is what is it purely? I guess you could say, or what is it without all of those pieces? And he looked at. For humans, he, he, he sometimes I think to his disadvantage because it's a little parochial, but you know, he saw everything through or most things through um, being and his idea of being uh, was different than an ego or an eye or something like that. His idea is 
uh, Dasein, right, um, which, which is uh, left there from the German, you know, is being there, right? So it's just human existence. And so each person has their own Dasein, right, which, you know, is, is stating that, you know, how I experience the world is unique and there's nobody else that's going to have that experience, right? But that doesn't mean that other things don't exist, right? Or the existentials, as he, he called them. And so he's making these distinctions between um, present at hand, readiness to hand, and then each individual person's Dasein. And so his idea was that things don't exist in the same way that we do. And this was his distinction. So objectively, right? I think I've used this example before, but this pen exists. But it has... There's a present at hand, meaning that it has all of the capabilities to do things. Um, uh, but there is a readiness to hand, meaning that it can be used for something. And it has multiple uses. It has an intention in mind, right? It can be used for predominantly for writing. Um, it could be used as, you know, a placeholder of sorts. I mean, you could use it as a weapon, I guess. But there's, there's things that are, it's ready to hand. But the, the difference here, and for Heidegger, and, you know, this is why he talked about hammers and tools a lot is those things, the pen isn't having a good day and, and thinking, wow, I'm having a fantastic day and you know, I, I wonder when the next time someone's going to pick me up and write with me. It's not doing that. And it only has a function um, and it only exists within it connecting or bumping into one's Dasein. As soon as my Dasein, my being, picks it up and chooses to write with it or whatever, it is ready to hand. It is also present at hand as well. But his idea was that each person's Dasein is, 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 is driving the ship here. And, and we need to do that with responsibility and authenticity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so what is absolutely right of trying to understand how do we, we understand our being and who we are um, by understanding how we are also, it, you know, w how we interact with things or objects that are, are present at hand. In terms of... Um, uh, truth and art. Uh, I had an interesting conversation about this uh, <laughs> um, maybe about a week or so ago in a different context about, you know, Heidegger, much like Nietzsche, much like many of these, these philosophers, believe that most truth or, or the highest forms of truth are or predominantly are only in art because it's stripped away of these objective subjective pieces. And you're just getting the experiences themselves. And that's what's coming out in art. And you can understand more for Heidegger, and less so for Nietzsche. I mean, Nietzsche has a philosophy of life that he was very concerned about, and that's why he emphasized the art piece. But uh, in that really big uh, essay that Heidegger wrote um, on art and truth, you know, the origins of art is truth or whatever the, whatever the art essay is called, he talks about how we understand uh, the truth that comes out in art more about our own Dasein. It's almost like this dialogue between ourselves. We don't know what's uncovered when we put it out. We see the truths, and then we learn more directly back about our being and who we are. And so, uh, later Heidegger, you know, truth has more of the character of an event. Um, you know, example, as an example, art could be that. And so that event of truth is unconcealing, right? You really think of like, you know, you have a blanket over something and then you pull it over and you, you, you're, you're unconcealing it, right? Or you're unveiling it. Um, and that, uh, that unconcealment is telling you something about your being, your Dasein, but it also tells you th other things as well, right? So sometimes when we do an unconcealment of truth through a medium such as art, we can, it, 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 it breaks open this like, you know, open space or open runway, um, in which then there's openness to everything else that is other than the usual. So there's this like a aspect of seeing these types of things as events for this kind of truth unlocking, where then it kind of has this, um, uh, I don't want to sound weird, but like a portal to then say, well, what other things of openness could we know about our own Dasein, but then about other exist existentials, and then other things in life in the backdrop of 
um, he talks about four different types of worldhood, or, or excuse me, world. And probably the most significant here would be the wherein, right? Which is where we as um, beings are interacting within the world and we're living within the world with other types of uh, other individuals and, and other things and other people and other objects. And that all of this is this kind of um, back and forth dialogue that we have, that we're understanding more about ourselves through the truth we find in art and those types of mediums, and then opening us up to other types of truth uh, with other folks as well in the, in the interpersonal realm and, and the other, et cetera. So, uh, sorry, I know it's a slight tangent, but I, I don't know if that, if that, uh, what that um, resonates for you in your mind or where that sits for you in your, in your mind. No, I, co I completely agree with you. And actually in my data, um, the readiness to hand, and I use that concept several times it, it really illustrated quite nicely certain points that i was trying to convey that i don't think i would have been able to mm -hmm. without drawing upon mm -hmm. um heidegger's work and one example that really stands out to me just listening to what you were saying was um one of my participants in my origin study i did a study about um what people identify as their origins or contributing factors towards developing BVD. Um, one participant spoke about being at school and he had several moles on his body mm -hmm. and the children you know, brought his attention to those moles. I, I drew upon Sartre for that part with um, the body being in itself and then changing to mm -hmm. becoming to, to itself mm -hmm, for the, mm -hmm. the people interpersonally. Yeah. But one of the things that he did that really it's always stayed with me was um he went into the playground after the children had mentioned this to him that he has lots of moles and he picked up a stone a sharp stone in the playground and performed self-surgery on him on on his leg oh, and no. on his thigh and on his arm to remove the moles on his body mm -hmm. and that's powerful in itself yeah. But when I thought of it in in terms of something being ready to hand that small sharp stone, which mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. lot of people would not think to use something mm -hmm. like that. That's right. To, to remove a mole. And yeah. it was that desperation that I yeah. was able to emphasize through drawing upon that concept. Yes. So I think it is it is really, really useful using this kind of method yeah, and applying yeah. it to this data. That, that's a fantastic example. I, I, a very tragic one, but uh, mm. a, a very, I think, apt one uh, for sure. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that the, you know, based on, on, on the paper, and it sounds like from your, 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 your dissertation, that this is a very robust and wide-ranging way of looking at body dysmorphic disorder in ways that maybe haven't. So, I, I guess just before we leave here, is there anything else that you want to say about your, your work or your research that you've done in, in this way uh, on, on the disorder? Um, just that lots more needs to be done. <laughs> sure, <laughs> There's sure, the, sure. I'm starting some new projects, hoping to delve more deeply into this, but it's the childhood experiences that I'm now particularly interested in mm -hmm. because um, through generating this data, and through the artwork that participants have created and written mm -hmm. pieces, poetry, mm -hmm. it becomes really apparent that um, it's the childhood where all of this begins, where this all starts. I think, I think that the pictures you show me, I think just in general, <clears throat> you know, it becomes a type of projective assessment of sorts, right? You know, what, what, what could be said and what is being said and, and, you know, that is a much different kind of, um, you know, way of the, uh, of getting at that than just asking somebody, well, did this happen or what is this like? You know, you can kind of get at it in a, in a much more, um, I don't want to say authentic way, but in a way that is more just kind of 
you know, uncovered from itself from within. And, and, and the person probably doesn't even know how they're going to do it until they do it. So I think that's what's really powerful about it. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic work that, you, that you've done. It's really, really, really awesome. Thank you. So let's uh, end here with treatment. Um, yeah. <clears throat> you know, we can, we've talked about um, the disorder uh, pretty, pretty, pretty extensively. I think we, we hit all, all points of it. Um, we talked about uh, your wonderful research using um, you know, art and phenomenology, which I think is, which is great. Um, so in terms of treatment, just a, a few questions here. Um, to my knowledge, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is you know, empirically supported for most disorders, and I think it is for OCD, if I'm not mistaken. Is CBT also the supported treatment for body dysmorphic disorder since it's in the same kind of category or, or are there other empirically supported treatments for uh, body dysmorphic disorder? Yeah, um, I'd say CBT is possibly the main one that people uh, would recommend mm -hmm. for uh, BDD, but it, it's not always successful in, sure. I mean, you can, you can never say that a treatment will work for everybody and it's mm -hmm. the same case with this as well. And I think one of the key things that people need to consider in, in treatment and in looking for treatment is where, how this came about. And one treatment that I've been looking at recently for BDD is EMDR therapy. Mm -hmm. And that's usually used to treat PTSD. But I think for experiences such as emotional abuse, sexual abuse, bullying in childhood, EMDR could be a really beneficial mm. um, treatment for people who have those memories. And um, I think it was David Field who did some research on, was it David? I might be wrong. I've got it written down somewhere. There was a... Um, study that showed that people with BDD often think about visual memories that have occurred in their mm. life. Mm. And so again, with the connection between the visual memory, I think it's important to consider EMDR, even though it's, it's expensive. I know it's hard to, mm -hmm. hard to get that treatment. Sure. It could be um, quite positive experience for some people. Yeah. I think for, um, it's an eye movement desensitization. Uh, I always forget the last Reprocessing. one. Reprocessing. Reprocessing, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, mo the studies that I've read, I'm, I'm not an expert in it, but um, colleagues and studies I've read have shown it's, it's mostly the, the imagery that, that is, uh, is there, uh, less so about the eye movements, um, although there's some value to it, but it's mostly the imagery work is really what it is that's there. Um, and so there's kind of this uh, implicit, I guess, exposure of sorts. So it, there's this, there's, there's some, um, it, it does work, I think, uh, pretty well for, for PTSD. So that would be interesting to see if it, if it would be um, supported for uh, body dysmorphic disorder. Any other empirical supported treatments that you know of? Um, CBT is usually the go-to. Uh, is there any others? Though? Yeah, um, there is some work on compassion-focused therapies as wow. well. Um, not as much as CBT, sure. but again, something to consider as well. Um, I've written about it a little bit in my work, but not in great depth, but it is something that I want to look into a bit more. Just, just to uh, a small point on that. Most people ask, well, why is CBT always the one? So, you know, it's, there is somewhat of a popularity of it of sorts, but the thing is, is that it's a very easy thing to quantify and manualize, and it gets the most funding and the most research grants, and other treatments uh, are less likely to get that. And so sometimes because something isn't, I don't think we should do treatments that aren't empirically supported necessarily, uh, at least not as a primary. Um, I, I do think we need to have be doing empirically supported treatment. Uh, uh, for for uh, clients, but <clears throat> because it's not doesn't mean that it's bad. It just hasn't been able to be done because of you know funding or other you know political red tape kind of stuff like that. But um, I, that's just kind of a small footnote there in that piece. Uh, what about art therapy? Is there art therapy that's done? Uh, so obviously you've done some of the research with the the art and and, and uh, 
kind of getting that out from from some of the participants but there is art therapy is obviously a uh its own thing i think it has its own association organization stuff like that is is art therapy used for body dysmorphic disorder or, or, or no not so much you would think that it would be used quite a lot <laughs> because of <laughs> because of the the importance of the visual aspect of bbd sure. and how right. difficult it is to convey that but um from my research i haven't actually seen a huge amount of um research on art therapy but i did very recently come across um a psychotherapist that uses art therapy her own type of art therapy to treat people with bdd um mm -hmm. if your listeners are interested her name is heather britton mm -hmm. and her website is arttherapyuk.co.uk um it looks really promising her work looks amazing and mm -hmm. i've actually got a meeting in a couple of weeks to talk about it um, mm. in some in some more detail but um, I know that art therapy as you said it's used anyway for treatments with a lot of mental health conditions um, probably most notably to me for psychosis yep. there's been a um, there was a paper published in the Lancet by Atard and Michael Larkin who was my old PhD supervisor now colleague and that was a brilliant um that was a review of the literature to mm. support well to look at the efficacy of art therapy in treating psychosis and the qualitative data showed that it was mm -hmm, beneficial mm -hmm. and useful for for people to mm -hmm. have that treatment i think that um my exposure to that personally is that you know when i've worked inpatient um many, many folks inpatient have schizophrenia and, and uh Art therapy was always used as an adjunctive therapy. So I don't know if it would be a primary, but I think it definitely yeah. could be a powerful, uh, a very good supportive and or ad adjunctive uh, therapy to maybe a primary like CBT or something. So maybe, maybe in those ways it could be utilized uh, as well. So uh, last question here. Um, anything else that you want to say about uh, body dysmorphic disorder? How do we continue to reduce the stigma? And, you know, kind of just uh, where do you think uh, things go for here, for the research and treatment, et cetera, for, for the disorder? I think, um, well, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> and it's the end now. I think with um, reducing stigma, it's really important that people, first of all, become aware of the disorder. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to... I, I don't want to use the eliminate, <laughs> I don't want to use the word eliminate, but it's coming to mind. Those mm -hmm. phrases, those um, unhelpful terms such mm -hmm. as Zoom dysphoria, Snapchat dysphoria, they're not helpful and they minimize the condition, as mm -hmm. you said, and they do contribute to the stigma that people face. I think it's important for people to, to know what it is, how mm -hmm. to recognize it, and to recognize it in the cosmetic settings, not just in you know, the mental health settings that we've, we've spoken about. Um, what was your other question, sorry, on... on... No, just about, um, you know, where, where do you think things go in, in the future for okay. more research and more treatment? Um, and just where any, any signs of optimism that you may yeah. see for, for, for trying to deal with uh, such a difficult disorder? I think it's also important to look at um, people's help seeking journeys. I know that is a barrier. So even if you do come forward and talk to a professional about what you're going through, um, certainly in the UK, there are lots of barriers, really long waiting lists and not enough suitable treatments, I'd say, for BDD that are affordable for people, yeah. such as EMDR, which could mm -hmm. be really promising for some people who have those flashbacks or visual you know, mm -hmm. memories, but they're not accessible treatments. So I think, again, that will be down to funding, which I know will be a huge problem, especially mm -hmm. after the pandemic. I've heard um, a lot about the, yeah. the trials and tribulations of NHS over there in the UK. So it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's a different challenge that they have over there but is we in the united states have a whole labyrinth of issues for our healthcare system as well so it's uh it's sad that in 
two of the biggest Western countries, you know, they just can't get their health care right. So it's very frustrating. Yeah, it is, it is. Yeah. And so I, I hope that one day people will be able to access these treatments more easily and hopefully benefit from them because it's great to see in a research paper that it's worked, but you mm -hmm. want to actually mm -hmm. be able to give that treatment yeah. to people yeah. and, and no. help, help them. Yeah, I, I, actually, I absolutely agree with that. Um, Shoma, this was a lot of fun. You are uh, quite, you know, brilliant, and I, I really like your work and uh, your passion and uh, kind of your demeanor and, and tenor about talking about a really tough disorder. Um, so I, I greatly appreciate you coming on and, and talking to me about about this. Any place where people can find you or find your work? Anything uh, that you want to to share on that end of things? Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter. Um, my handle is just my first name with an underscore. It's S H I O M A underscore L E I. <laughs> um, I'm based at Aston University currently, so you'll find me on, on their website. But I'm always happy to talk about my research. Feel free to contact me online or by email. Mm -hmm. And I also run a BDD peer support forum called BDD and Me which is just bddandme.co.uk mm -hmm. and you can you can reach me through there as well that's that's fabulous and um thank you so much this was such a pleasure i, I really uh, feel very fulfilled uh talking about this and, and being able to really um, excavate a lot of the uh, details about the disorder your work um, i hope that it's um, at the very least informative to listeners and then hopefully make them more aware of some of the things that we've discussed so just can't say enough uh, thanks thank you so much for having me i've, I've really enjoyed it yep, thank absolutely. you absolutely absolutely